Scotty, thank you very much indeed. Ladies and gentlemen, again, a very good morning to you. Welcome. Um, we're looking at the future of journalism and the role of international broadcasters. Nothing like discussing the big subjects before lunch. But we are going to deal with big subjects because high on the list is the safety of journalists around the world. If they're not safe, and they're not safe at the moment, what kind of future is journalism going to have? Also, repressive regimes and supposedly non-repressive regimes clamping down harder on free speech. Where will the battle lines for that be in the future? And who's going to lead those battles? Is it going to be the international broadcasters? Is it going to be the editors, the publishers, media houses? Who's going to join forces to try and bring out uh, the best from the media? Um, according to Freedom House, only 14% of the global population lives with what they call a free press and what others around this table might call a relatively free press. All that and journalism in the digital age. Is it going to be quicker and slicker? And what about quality? Something that uh, Matthias Dufner was talking about a moment ago. Just a few of the topics we're going to get to over the next 90 minutes. Matthias Dörfner is chairman and CEO of Axel Springer. You've heard from him. Jeff Jarvis, author, blogger, and professor of journalism at the City University of New York. Peter Limburg is director general of Deutsche Welle. Salak Negem uh, is director of news at the Al Jazeera channel based in Qatar. And Jawar Sirka is CEO of Prasa Bharati, which is India's public service broadcasting. Let me just uh, tell you how this is going to go. We're going to talk amongst the panel. First of all, we're going to hear from uh, Chiponda Chimbalo, who is going to keep us up to date with the Twitter feed, uh, what you are saying to us, what kind of questions you're asking. Uh, and then we'll hear from the audience. There are various question points, I think, out there where you can go um, to put your questions. We also can get microphones to you. There are roving microphones in the audience as well. So please do take advantage of them. Um, actually, before we just get started, six men sitting on a panel. Don't tell me this is the future of journalism. Really. Please, Peter Limbo. <laughs> it can't be. No, no, it can't be. Next year we will <laughs> replace you by a young lady. This is for sure. And uh, Get, I, have to as they say in I have to admit that Mrs. Merkel hadn't timed this uh, today. So, uh, but uh, you're right. Uh, we have to work on this. But we are quite good at it in Deutsche Welle. We have a program directress, um, Gada Moya. She is the one who is responsible for the whole program. Next time, she might be sitting here. Oh. Yes, it's six men in tie. <laughs> yeah, that, that's even worse, isn't it? Okay, all right. Safety of journalists, I, I want to bring up, first of all, because uh, this is a huge issue now, not just in war zones but in countries which are clamping down more and more on free speech. Uh, Salak Negem, you and Al Jazeera have uh, felt the hard hand of the authorities in various countries. Um, why are we not doing enough? Why is the public not engaged enough to uh, worry about the safety of journalists? Um, are you talking about the public inside the countries? I'm talking or? about the, inside the countries and out as well. Okay, let me talk about the public inside the country. Uh, we cover uh, news from. In the past 20 years, the governments realized the power of independent media. They were reporting all sides of stories, uh, making an impact on the audience within restrictive uh, media inside each country, and actually changing attitudes and behavior and public opinion. The governments realized that, so they set up what seems to be independent media inside their countries. And there was one factor to overcome, which is the factor of trust. If you are international broadcaster, really objective, cover all sides of stories, you gain trust of the people inside this country. So they tackled this, uh, this factor uh, in times of crises like now. And they started attacking the, the factor of trust that people put in independent media. Attacking people, attacking organizations, discrediting them, accusing them of spying, of bias, of distorting and, and the information. And the public brought into this. And they then, brought into this. And then they, the public apparently bought into this, and they turned the public against journalists who are covering in the field. But what about the, what about the global public? Why, why are they not bo more bothered about journalists? No, I think, think uh, the, the last uh, events that Al Jazeera journalists witnessed in Egypt, the sentences unfair and uh, fabricated charges, unfair sentences, they have 
actually attracted the support of public around the world. The hashtag about free Al Jazeera stuff, I think, attracted 1.2 billion people uh, supporting it. A lot of media organizations showed solidarity uh, with our journalists as well as other journalists. And, and, who and are a, lot didn't. A, lot, a lot didn't show any solidarity at all. Did uh, it? Let's look at the positive side. That movement is well, let's starting. Let's talk about the realistic side, shall we? Yeah. Uh, we have to try and we have to fight our battle and we have to uh, seek uh, protection for journalists in the field, be it in Egypt or in Syria or in Iraq or in any tense situation. Peter Limburg, do you think the international broadcasters have done enough to highlight the case of the safety of journalists around the world? I think we're trying always because uh, it's uh, in the core of our business to, to bring news and information towards our public. and. Uh, um, I think uh, the, the Al Jazeera case shows uh, um, that, that they're not only in danger of, of, the, of risking their lives for, for covering news, but they're also in, in danger of being uh, arrested by, by uh, regimes who are very doubtful in, 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 in their behavior. Um, but I think uh, the, the main question is journalists uh, are not always trying to be everybody's best friend. So they, they, they don't usually have a, a real... Um, a supportive group behind them and this is uh, might be uh, very short-sighted because uh, uh, journalists um, um, might be some personal um, cases of, uh, of weaknesses among them but in general they, they, they serve the public and they, they, they can bring um, um, really uh, stories which are normally uh, would be would be not shown and uh, I think they're very, very useful for the general public worldwide and uh, should have been more protection and more solidarity uh, from the viewers and also from, from the competitors. But I think uh, mm -hmm. in general we are not uh, in, the, in, in the situation that we would uh, ignore the Al Jazeera case or ignore uh, when, when French journalists from, from RFE get killed in Mali. Okay. We always are aware of this. Chef Jarvis, um, journalists are traditionally reticent about doing stories about other journalists perhaps. Journalists become the story when they're killed, when they're put in jail unfairly. Um, why has the press been slow to react to that as a story? I'm not sure that's so much the story here. I, I'm honored to have followed Dr. Bassem Youssef up here on the stage, who's a media hero of mine. As he said, so much of what goes on is about fear. And the great irony of what's happened with the journalists in Egypt is the government proved themselves more fearful than anyone. Because the government were fe afraid of a funny man and afraid of journalists. And the government of Egypt has now embarrassed itself and humiliated itself on the world stage with what it has done to journalists there. And you think it really feels that? Embarrassed and humiliated on it, the world stage? It, you, you can say that. They don't look that embarrassed and humiliated when they get out, do they? I'm just saying that to the rest of the world, they come off as uh, Freddy cats and, and, and as, and as uh, little men. And if they, cannot, if they cannot bear the truth and they cannot bear talk, but it's not just journalists anymore. It's very important not to act as if this is a closed fraternity of men in, in, in suits and ties. Everyone now can share with the world. Everyone has a megaphone to talk with the world. And so these governments fear that speech and their speech. But so we shouldn't, just issue, be about, we shouldn't just be about defending our own fraternity. We should defend anyone in the world with that megaphone that is now the Internet. But that includes journalists. Yes, well. of course. Matthias Dörfner, can you explain the, the, the paradox? We've never had more access to information than we have at the moment. But freedom of speech is on the slide. Only 14% of the world's population have access to a free press. Well, I have an explanation for that. I think that has to do with uh, um, a psychology that plays a role in a lot of saturated, free, democratic societies. They think that their rule of law and their standard of living and their freedom is something that is like a, a law, a rule of nature. That it is something that has been given and will never be taken away. And if there are other countries and other systems that do not enjoy that, well, it may be too early for them. So That's people are complacent said. about I it. I think it is absolutely complacency, and that is when it comes to deal with the limitations of freedom of press. The freedom of press, freedom of media has always been one of the essential fundaments next to the rule of law uh, for free democratic societies. And I think that is not, there's no room for any compromise here. Either there is freedom of press or not. And People should do everything to simply take that freedom, and if they are blocked in doing so by governments, they should find global solidarity. And I'm sometimes disappointed that this solidarity speaks with a very low voice. Good.
Could, could your group speak with a louder voice? Pardon me? Could your group speak with a louder voice? Uh, honestly speaking, I'm very self-critical. We do a lot of mistakes every day. But on that front, I think we do. We have regular columns every week, sometimes daily. We are really speaking up uh, on that issue. This I, uh, here, I think, I mean, we can always improve. But that is something where we are pretty firm. Uh, is I think we're narrowing the issue to just a binary between a journalist who speaks up for the free press and a regime that doesn't allow him. It's far more complex. A, I would insist, I would, I would submit that we do not judge all countries in one standard where the, where the tussle between the authorities and what is termed to be free speech goes on. I mean, let's not standardize countries because they have different cultures. That's what I am. Of course, I don't speak for India in that sense. I'm in the sense that we are the only one between Casablanca and Philippines that never allowed the army to step out of their barracks. We speak with that experience. So number one, there has to be a strong civil society that has to grow organically. It cannot be produced under fertilizer conditions. Number two, a journalist is one of those who speak for the free press. He doesn't have a monopoly. Number three, the threat is not only from state power. Of course, all state powers have this inherent urge to hegemonize. That, that comes in genetically. I've served on the other side for about 36 years. It's a very genetic trait. I mean, they don't feel bad about it to, to, pass, to sort of get their ideas across. But other than state power, now look at, you send a guy to Afghanistan. In Afghanistan, the state power supports you in, let's say, your venture. There are others who don't. So there are non-state players who, who, who queer the pitch. But what are, what are the threats to free press in India? Um, Increasing political it's, control of the press? A, I don't see any control of that type, but censorship is something complained against. But let's hang on. In the last elections that we turned out about 550 million people voting, we see the power of the internet was very strong. And in that internet space, which is open space, I assume, trolling was lousy. Trolling was bad. You were trolled with, uh, by all sorts of people. So allurement is another way of silencing speech. Allurement by big corporates who started buying up the press all over the world is another allurement. So let's not reduce it to a binary of physical threat from a determinable state and a particular journalist. But you have more than a third of news channels in India owned by politicians or political That's figures. the point I was making. So the politicians of different shades, including the opposition owning these presses, is another point that I was getting to. Apart from corporate oligopolies and big businesses taking over surreptitiously so and other way, now they're calling the shots. So the dissidence, incidentally, is big business. Let's not underrate that fact. Dissidence makes good business. So we have a very complex world that we're dealing with. We have a, a free space of the internet that is being trolled. B, we have within the internet elements that aren't exactly votaries of, let's say, the good order. We had one particular message that sent uh, 10,000 people from one city packed into like sardines in a train back home because they said that this community is in danger. And we couldn't scream all over, but a rumor is a rumor. So we have both. But mercifully, the internet space is predominantly occupied by the proponents of open information. Okay, all right. I want to bring Jeff Jarvis in here. Um, to what extent do you think journalists are equipped and supported to operate in this very complex environment, difficult environment, threatening environment sometimes in which they have to operate and will have to operate in the future? I'm not sure I understand the question. Well, if you look at uh, the threats to free speech, if you look at the increasing political control, if you look at uh, those countries that are seeking to stamp out free speech and to make use of technological innovation to uh, control new media, this is, this is a new battleground, isn't it? Once again, you're, you're, I think you're being far too limiting in talking just about this closed, small group of journalists. Well, we're the talking about the future is, of journalism. Well, the future of journalism is the people. Full stop. It's everyone. 
and, and until we learn that it is our role to serve, our role is not to become a factory that makes content. That's what Gutenberg allowed. We instead are a service. The world can share its information on its own. What happened in Tahrir Square was that people were using the tools of the internet. It was not a Twitter revolution. It was not a Facebook revolution. It was a revolution of brave people who happened to have new tools to find each other and connect and communicate. And we as journalists then need to add value to that flow of information that occurs with or without us now. We are no longer the gatekeeper. Now, thanks to the net, anyone can share with anyone if the net is allowed to be free. All bits are created equal. All ends are equal. And people can share with each other. Now, that's not complete. And that's where we as journalists have to rethink at the fundamental role, our, our, our place in society. And, and when people are wrong about something, we can correct it. When, we, when there's a rumor, we can debunk it. We can add facts to discussion. We can answer questions. We can go ask the questions that aren't being answered. These are all well, journalistic what roles. What are we supposed to do? We what also we thought we were, we were thought in position of being a gatekeeper. We thought in position of making stories as a content and a product. No, I think we're a service. And a service is going to judge its success on whether it helps the people do what they want to do, not what we think they should do. So I think your question is very limiting. I think that, that, that what we're trying to do in journalism is to rethink our fundamental role with society. And in that case, then, we are a service organization. We help people do what they want to do. Our first skill is not to speak, but is to listen. And that's a skill that we journalists don't have terribly well. Matthias Dufton. May, may I just try to be a little more concrete? The, the question sometimes starts when big news organizations, editorial teams, have to make a decision whether they send a correspondent to a country where there is a war or where there is a crisis or there is uh, something going on that is limiting freedom and uh, society and the system. And more and more, the decision is better we do not send somebody. It's a huge risk. And of course, journalists risk their life if, if they go into these regions. And another aspect comes, it is very costly. So sending somebody for a couple of weeks into such a region, you don't know exactly what the outcome is. So I think we absolutely may not bow to these two factors. One is, I have to call it, cowardice, and I think it, to a certain degree cowardice is human, but particularly for journalists it is something that we definitely cannot afford. So and we second, need to go and risk our lives. In yes, these sorry, it may sound a bit pathetic, but I think that's what we have to do. It is very important. And uh, of course you should not force somebody to go into such a region. Uh, it's a very individual decision, decision and somebody who has a family should take uh, lower risks than somebody who is a well-trained um, um, war reporter, for example. But the other element also is we need healthy, economically healthy, healthy ecosystems in order to afford these uh, trips. Peter Limbo. Um, I, I do not uh, really agree with the description of journalism from, from you, Jeff, because uh, um, I think it still is a profession and you learn it and you, you have skills and you need to be educated and uh, you have a sort of uh, um, uh, res responsibility. You're not only a service organization. Um, I think we are. We are. What, what, is, what, is the, what is our goal as journalists? What yes. are we? What are we? What are we here to do then? Just, We're not just to serve. servicing and, and putting one user-generated content no, uh, towards that. the other and that that's it. I don't think this is the role. I think uh, the role is also to 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 be responsible informers, to to be not uh, biased, so to 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 show uh, both sides and uh, to to judge um, when you have very different opinions and then bring it together and then. Uh, maybe also show um, um, the, the, the pros and the cons. And I think uh, to only let the users just make themselves uh, and mingle around, it, it's very interesting, but it's not, I think, the task of journalism alone. Instructions to the Financial Times, their new reporters. Find the news and tell it. That's it. You disagree with that? Again, and the first bit is the most important. important part, partly, while I while I hearken back to someone not far from here in Mainz, in 1450, Gutenberg invented the press. Here, it took 50 years for the book to take its own form, 100 years for this impact on society to be felt, 150 years before anyone imagined the idea of creating a newspaper, 400 years before the newspaper became uh, something in the hands of the common person. We, it's too soon, far too soon to think that we know what the hell the internet is and that we should define it in the analog of our ways in the past. 
We have no idea what it is yet. No idea. And so, and so, let me just, and so, I'm glad we're getting the points you talked about, and I would like to talk about them. No, um, I want to come back to his point, because you're not referring to that. We are not, in that point, we are not discussing the role of the Internet. He was asking what is the role of journalists. And, and the question saying, is, which role will journalists play in the digital world? That's, that may be another question. And I'm I saying, totally agree with your Gutenberg theory, but Gutenberg was not a journalist. Gutenberg was an infrastructure provider, and he has enhanced democracy or perhaps even created uh, preconditions for democracy. And no question. But it is not an answer to his question or to his point about the role of journalism. Well, and, and, this and, is, I think, a very and, crucial dis discussion for us here. And then, just as now, Lieber Matthias, uh, the competitors of Gutenberg went to government to try to stop this new technology and to try to regulate it. So we find ourselves in that same position today, don't we? Where we see an effort to say that we're trying to control the new world in the image of the old. So I'm saying we don't know what journalism is now. It is time to reinvent journalism and rethink it and not start with the assumption that we already know what it is and what is possible. The internet opens up incredible and unlimited new possibilities in journalism, and we don't know what they are yet. So, no, I'm not ready to say that the club is closed. So you're basically saying journalists shouldn't continue to do what they've been doing up till now. No, they, they should, should do that and listen, more. Listen, first of all, yes, and then listen. think. And do, and do more and find new ways and, to and do what, what they do. And what about finding the news and telling it? Isn't that the basic? Find facts, but it's not just who, who's, who's to say that journalists are God-given the right to determine what news is. But people look to journalists and journalists... Because we had no choice. Don't they? We had no choice. But they because, still do. Because they, they own the press and the rest of the world didn't. Yeah. Now the whole world owns the press. Get back on it. Please, please. Uh, and Salak Negan. Yeah. Okay. You, can, you can say the internet is one of the sources of the news. The news have so many sources. And journalism in general is to put things in context. You might get the individual piece of video that represents one point of view that goes viral. And this is communication. It's piece of information. Journalism is to add on that, explain it, put it in context, and show the people the priority, analyze it, give, it, give, the, give the piece of information the more added value. So also journalism is using innovation all the time. If we stood still by the technology which was in the 50 or the means of communication which was there, we would have been extinct for a long time. But whenever you have a new piece of innovation, we use drones, we use satellite images, we use very mobile devices for collecting information. And actually, when we get different sources of news, for example, uh, social network uh, sites, that's a very good source of news, but it will need vetting, verification, and actually uh, confirmation for that. And people need that. So journalism is different than uh, communication via internet, and we have to, to make the, the distinction. Let me ask you a question. Would you, say, would you go so far to say perhaps we don't need journalism anymore? No, quite the contrary. We need journalism more than ever, but we need to rethink what journalism is, and we have the opportunity to do so. And all I'm arguing is it is too soon to define what that is, and thus limit it, and thus regulate it, and thus close it down. Quite to the contrary, it is our job to open up journalism as much as possible, to collaborate with the public in ways that are not possible, and not just to dismiss it and call it user-generated content. No, it's the, it's the people in the democracy that we serve. We are subservient to them, as you said. And so we need to listen to them first to find out what their needs are and to find out how we add to that. No, there's more need for journalism than ever, and journalists must rethink what they can do to serve society in new ways. Peter Lindbergh, are you rethinking? And then I'll come I'm, to, I'm, to I'm, us. I'm always that. rethinking, um, but uh, I think in, in, in this case, this sounds more uh, than, than uh, what I could, could accept, because uh, for, for your first remarks, I thought you, you want to get rid of journalists. And uh, I think we should uh, strengthen journalism worldwide and give them more rights and not get rid of them, because uh, uh, when we don't need any journalists anymore, then, then uh, I think uh, it would be much more easier for people to, to suppress their own people, for, for uh, mighty ones. And so I think the journalists, they should have, uh, should have more strengthening. But I, I agree with you that, uh, um, uh, it, it is, that the time is, is gone where journalists are arrogantly looking at the world and telling other people what to do. We should listen to them. And this is what we at Deutsche Welle would like to do more than having participation and having the channel open to, to let people talk, what they think and what they view and what they see. So I don't think there's a very a big... Uh, but there's a difference between that and news, terms. isn't there? Oh, yes. There's a, news, first of all, um, can, be, can be brought up by everyone, but it has to be confirmed by somebody. So um, uh, if you just send something into the Internet and say, this is true, 
um, then there is maybe nobody who can confirm it. So journalists have to have also played this role to be precise and to see, is this really true what the guy in whatever well, what, uh, country What Andy said. Grove, the former boss of Intel, called an intelligent agent. Is that what you would, would you buy into? Well, uh, the agents and journalists, no, I don't think. No, no, no. journalists are journalists and, and, and don't Well, he said, how would I have learned about the atrocities of Rwanda or the former Yugoslavia? I needed an intelligent agent to keep me informed about news I couldn't anticipate. Because there is a blizzard of too much information on the internet, I need them to sort out what is and is not important. Very well said. And isn't yeah? there another element? It is, it is a trustful and responsible source. So if a journalist says... Which has to have a track record. It's, it's a track record, but it's also if somebody makes a mistake, which happens, even f uh, the best journalists make mistakes, then you take responsibility. Okay. Yeah, and I think that's... A, that's Joao, a Joao uh, See, I'm the only guy here who's not a professional journalist. I look after about 7,000 of them and their fate, but... Uh, hard enough. It's hard <laughs> enough. And, but taking a top view on the whole matter, a, we need journalists and their ethics to set the benchmark. It's a profession, after all. It has an element of picking up the nose for news, relate it, and convey, package, convey. That would remain the three elements of picking up, validating, packaging, and conveying. These would remain. But would you consider Dr. Yusuf to be a journalist? Yes, no. My submission is that Journalism is also something that is being crowdsourced over the net. Journalism, Which you saw in your recent elections. I, well, I, I didn't right. mean to play any role, but uh, it was thrust upon me. So one has to take a stand, and I would rate the person who got the most, most, uh, the most rousing uh, ovation here today was not a professional journalist. So I would submit that journalism is a profession that sends certain bench benchmarks, but others who operate within these benchmarks or make deviations slightly to the contrary, people who can, ex who can sort of do the job, sorry to hurt you, even better, like Yusuf, would stand to be termed as journalists even if they never went through journalism school. So we do need professionals, professionals in every profession. We need people who have the academic and the, and the rigor and the, eth uh, the, the professional ethics to guide the STEM, even in this sort of anarchic internet age. We need that. But please keep the profession open to, as I call it, crowdsourced journalism. Crowdsourced journalism can throw up some of the finest examples of humanity who follow this sort of three, three point pattern and come out with even better products. Uh, question? Uh, yeah. Not to pick on Dr. Youssef, but would you say that, that what he does and what John Stewart does is a journalistic function in the ecosystem of news and information? It is. I mean, it can't always be a pedantic uh, sort of a narration of what happened in very serious overtones. If he can do it with a lot of uh, candy uh, or bitter candy, it makes, I mean, he gets, gets the audience much more than any other journalist would. Why, why, don't, why don't we ask him? I mean, do you think of yourself as a journalist? Yes. <laughs> There's only one Basim Yusuf here. Yeah. Well, I, I'd like to think of myself as, uh, as uh, the normal guy who sits at the back of the bus that won't get bored. We'll just get a microphone to you, sorry. Yeah, well, we know, uh, I think we're just like the normal kid at the back of the bus throwing spitballs at everybody. So I think it's more of... Um, Citizen journalism. It's kind of like uh, I never studied uh, media. I never studied journalism. Uh, we, we were doing this intuitively. I think uh, we're not. I mean, we were, we, people think of us as so many things, and that's actually get us in trouble. So uh, I, I, I think uh, I, I agree with the fact that you really, maybe you really need to redefine journalism from the beginning from again. But uh, no, I, I just had a show, and now I don't have a show anymore. <laughs> <laughs> but how would you like to see it redefined? Well, I, that, that's, a, that's a huge discussion. And I, I mean, that's the yeah, one we're having. Yes, exactly. Uh, and, yeah. I, and I don't see you agreeing. <laughs> so, but, but I think it's, uh, the, the Internet makes everything. I mean, I agree with the fact that you had, need to have profession, professionals everywhere. 
I mean, or else you're gonna have internet doctors also, and that's that's that would put me at, for the, my other job. Like you know, I will lose everything now. But um, uh, I, I think it, it should be open. There's citizen journalism, there are blogs, there are everything. But I think the people who claim that they are the face of professional journalism everywhere, they should stick to that tradition and not be swayed or dragged into the normal everyday life of the sensation of Twitter and Facebook. They should actually attain a higher standard. All right, Matthias Stefano, there's a, there's a danger that they will get dragged. Well, well I'm, I'm, I'm not 100% sure whether I really want to disagree with this uh, um, idea of redefining journalism. It's always good to question everything. It's always good to define and redefine. In any case, it is needed to improve. Um, and there will be a, a tremendous enrichment of journalism through the digital possibilities. I have mentioned some, there are many more, um, but we have to be careful, and here I uh, agree with you that we do not mix up things. The simple fact that the Internet provides a technology that facilitates and speeds up communication a great deal does not mean that it changes the journalism, uh, the role of journalism. The simple fact that we have social communities that connect people it does not mean that that is going to replace uh, journalism. So we have to be very careful. If we talk about technology and distribution tools, tremendous change. If we talk about uh, the, the uh, creative side of journalism, how it looks like, the storytelling, how you can present stories in, by, by including the smartness and the knowledge of your users, by being interactive, by including all categories of media, how these whole things will look like in the future. A tremendous change. But if it comes to the substance, I mean, actually, I liked his definition of journalism to, uh, to uh, throw, uh, how did you call it, spitballs? Yeah. I mean, in, in any case, journalists are, I mean, they, they focus attention on things that are relevant, particularly they focus on things that are not going well. They're asking critical questions. Questions are not very welcome. They are a kind of... Um, they, have, they, they play an almost disruptive role in a society. It's not about agreeing with everything. It's not about being in line with a, a government's uh, policy in general. This critical role of journalism, asking the nasty, unwelcome questions, bringing things up, news up, that should uh, uh, not come up. But people uh, need to this be is the role of journalism. Getting, they, they, people need to be clear what they're getting. If they're getting verified news stories, that have been subject to editing, that have been checked, or they're getting... Exactly, just a rumor unverified. or I, I'm totally agree. That's why I said it needs to be a trustful and responsible source, because if you read the news under that brand from this particular person, you know that if it's wrong, they either have to pay or they get, go... Uh, in, I mean, they, they, they face legal consequences. I think that that is really important. Salah Lagan, we're going to keep a clear wall between what is verified, edited, trusted, and what comes in... Um, which may be just as good, uh, maybe just as reliable, but it isn't verified. You I think the most important more. factor is trust, the trust factor, and the trust is built on the track record and, uh, let's say, editor public editorial guidelines, code of ethics, all the things that make a journalist a journalist. And I would like to think about journalism not as a profession, but as a mission. And some of the best journalists in, in the world didn't graduate from journalistic schools and they joined the profession later on. Basim himself is a journalist. Satire is a recognized form of journalism. If you think about how he started online and then he turned into an institution and very quality program, that's journalism as a profession. Started as a mission, ended uh, to be a, a profession. And he had a very, very strong impact there. I think the word trust is, is, is extremely important, but we, we fool ourselves too much in journalism to think that we own trust. In the U.S., at least, our numbers on trust are depressing, and uh, we own the monopoly. And I was talking to Chuck Peters from, from Cedar Rapids, Iowa, before, about trying to go out, if I may, and listen to communities out there. And the first thing that he said that happens is you get an hour or two of them telling you the things you've done wrong over the years because it's the first time you've listened. And so... I would like to think that journalists uh, can count trust as an asset, but we must earn it. We earn the trust. We don't own the trust. Yes. And that, that's a daily thing we, we do. We have to earn the trust every day and every minute. But, but, yeah. um, I want to turn to Chipanga at the moment, who's looking at the Twitter feeds. Have you got something for us? It's coming in on Twitter. 
Yes, uh, I do have, uh, I mean, there's been lots said and uh, tweeted more, like a thousand tweets per hour when Bassem Yusuf was speaking. Um, in terms of questions, at least related to the current discussion, we do have one question from MC Erastus, who asks, is social media or citizen journalism that much of a threat for traditional journalism? So maybe that's a question that you okay. could answer. Social media that it's much of a threat to traditional It's not journalism. a threat at all. It's, it's an not adjunct, a threat, isn't it? It's not a threat. It's a tremendous opportunity and an enrichment. It's a source of information because you get a lot of very relevant information through social media. It is a tool in order to share things that you as a journalist found out with uh, others. And uh, I, I think it is a wonderful technology, a wonderful tool that can enrich a journalism. Is it a tip-off service? Again. Pardon me? Is it a tip-off service as well? Among many other things. I, I'm sorry, but I'm, again, you, you, you act as if the journalism is up on some tiny pinnacle atop the mountain. What's on the other side no, of no, social media? We all need tip-offs. We all need tip-offs. What's on the other side of social media? The people. The people you serve. The democracy you serve. So, so you, you diminish it if you act about, oh, it's something we can learn occasionally. The witnesses who are there for news who can now share what they witness to the world because everyone has a sat truck in their pocket if they have one of these. And we hope more and more and more are going to have these. And there's more witnessing of what occurs because of these. That's the power. What's, what's, what's happening then is not the technology. The technology is enabling speech by the people. Salah, let me ask you this. Is social media interpersonal communication or mass communication? Because that's a very crucial question. I think social media is interpersonal communication. You reach people within your circle and the circle beside your circle. For um, traditional, as we, we discussed, media organizations, they are mass media and they reach millions and millions of people. Okay, and and the, the dilemma is people are trying to make the mass media use the social media in reaching these millions of people. And th that's a real the dilemma. There. Mass, the notion of a mass was an invention of media. I'm not a mass. You're not a mass. As Raymond Williams, the sociologist, says, there are no masses, only ways of seeing people as masses. It is inherently insulting to call the people of democracy a mass. We are not a mass. And finally, we get to be seen as individuals. And criticize Google as you will, but Google, and this may scare your Datenschutz German heart, but I'm happy that Google knows where I live and where I work because I get relevant data back in return. My newspaper has no idea where I live and where I work and who I am and can't give me relevance as a hand. So no, a mass is an insulting concept and an invention of media, and it is time for that to die. No, we are talking about mass media, not about masses. I think you are, no, no, you are confusing the two things. Mass what media is mass media, ma that mass which, media that which is, is a mass. No, 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 no. mass media is a media that gives a message directed to millions of people. It knows its categories. It's no, it, it knows its uh, uh, distribution. It knows uh, where they live from research and try to adjust that via feedback. While in social media, how many people are connected in social media in one circle? Because it's circles. It's not like... Uh, like society. Uh, like society, exactly. And that's why it was said that the world is a global village. So we have the two things on the internet. We have the mass media, which is a media directed to big number of people. And it's not an insult to direct media to big number of people. You can so pick and choose element. what you want discussion, but uh, the question was uh, whether social media helps uh, us in our daily business, mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. as far as I understood. And I think, uh, yes, it is an enrichment. Um, as we here at Deutsche Welle, we have 30 languages, and so we have 30 channels coming in, and we can, can get more stories, more interesting stories, um, to uh, the worldwide public because we have social medias, because we have people telling us what is going on in their countries. So I think, yes, the question is, it's an enrichment, and keep on uh, and, and have the discussion with us at Deutsche Welle and uh, surely with the other guys here too. Okay, I want to move the discussion on, if I may, to um, talk about international broadcasters and what the, the role of international broadcasters is now. Somebody once described them as uh, electronic co colonialism. Um, those days long gone, Peter Limbo? We have uh, done a lot of uh, bad things in our recent history, but colonism is not one of the, 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 the Electronic topics. Electronic. Uh, so um, I think uh, we, we here in Germany, in Deutsche Welle, we are far away from colonism, and um, that also helps us in some regions, I have to admit. Um, who's because, watching? Who's um, watching? Who's watching? Yes, normally, who's, normally um, I think watching, we're not days. only watching, we're, they're, only, they're also using it and, and they're, they're participating. So uh, it's not only TV, it's also the Internet, it's social media. 
And it's radio. So, um, uh, and I think it is, um, it, di it differs in some countries where you have uh, probably um, uh, no access to free information, you would have more people listening to you uh, and a broader uh, uh, people. Um, but uh, in free markets, it's a different, different uh, um, um, way. People are maybe interested in second opinions, third opinions. And uh, basically, at the end of the day, it's always uh, a small number of people. It's uh, kind of the decision makers. It's kind of the people who are interested in democracy, who are um, maybe more interested in politics uh, and economics than others. So um, I know that the world... But they have their own channels. So you've got falling audiences and we are always, falling budgets. We, 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 we have, <laughs> I believe, for the first time, <laughs> a small in, uh, increase in the budget. So, um, But uh, yes, we are structurally underfinanced uh, in what we're doing. And I think we also, uh, the, the politics should be even giving us more uh, money and, uh, and, and the German um, uh, public because... Uh, I think we're doing quite a nice job because um, um, in a country which is uh, so um, globalized and uh, um, has such an important role in, um, in, in foreign policy and uh, in, in their economics, I think it would be a good invest in, in, in a uh, media service like, uh, like uh, Deutsche Welle. But at the end of the day, it's always a, a small number of people. Some would call it elite, others would, would, would not use this word because uh, um, it, uh, it, it's always people who are, who are uh, always uh, not in power. They are more, more interested in Deutsche yeah. Welle. Mm -hmm. And I think it is a small amount, but a very interesting and a very important amount of people. Joe Asirka, representing uh, public service broadcasting in India. What's your unique selling point? India has hundreds of channels. So See, we had, uh, we had a different task cut out for us. Uh, it started with All India Radio, which was a British uh, instrument of, let's say, uh, imperial messaging. They left, left behind about 17 transmitters. Right now, we have 481 channels, TV channels, and radio stations. So it's unmanageably big. I'm sorry, it's, it's rather big. So who needs you? <laughs> okay. We provide what we call the central uh, part of the discourse, still. People want to read, uh, hear news, they open up All India Radio. On the TV front, we have got a bad licking because we went uh, jazzy enough. Uh, but the point is, it's not a question of competing against private news channels. Our mission is and was and will always be different. India is a multi-ethnic country. In 1947 till today, if you see, we are now 1.3 billion almost in size. Uh, 24 national languages, 600 dialects, and God knows how many communities. Holding them together in one commonwealth of an, around an idea of practicing democracy was our task. Knitting them together in some sort of unison, not standardization. We do not believe in either standardization or homogenization. Otherwise, we got the way some of our large neighbors did. But what do you offer? What do you offer? We that offer that others a, don't? We, offer, different? we offer at every corner of India a voice of their own. I'll give a small example. By Indian standards, a state like Manipur is very small. It's just about three million. Every day, we have 30 languages broadcast there. 30 languages in what we call small state of three million. So you understand this federal cultural equili equilibrium, if I may use the term, the tectonic plate uh, settlement is a massive task. So there, to that extent, we succeeded. On the TV front, we're getting a bad licking from, uh, from Star, from CNN, from the whole big, big boys. I'm not sure we'll, whether we are wiped off because our rotatings are okay, pretty okay. The problem was one of identity. Are we a state broadcaster? Or are we according to go according to the act of autonomy, arm's length? Right now, we are arm's length. Okay, all right. Salat Negan, why do people watch Al Jazeera? I'll give you do an they, example. Of, do they watch Al Jazeera they, these We days? reach 250 million households worldwide, and we are the highest viewed channel, international channel in Africa and Asia now. Uh, according to the last research I got. So what do people want uh, from you? What, are, uh, what uh, are they looking for from I'll, I'll you? Give you? I'll give you one example of something we have done. Uh, there was the 
presidential debate in Kenya, broadcasted live inside Kenya, I think one and a half years ago. Uh, no other broadcaster will carry it live. We decided to do that. So we carried three Kenyan presidential debates live. The biggest viewership was where? Not in Kenya, but in Ghana and Tanzania. People, for example, in these countries find that their problems are similar. They aspire to the same transparency. They want to see their issues debated on television. And they look forward for their next presidential campaign to see such a debate and they'll call for it. So that's one thing we do. And when their own channels start doing the same thing, when, when you, you give up and go home. Well, I'll tell you, the map of viewership and, uh, and audience of international broadcasting is ever-changing. The map was different in the Middle East three years ago. It's totally changed now. In the Middle East, there was a movement for liberalizing media, more free press three years ago. Now it isn't anymore. So we have bigger market there. So that map is shifting. It's not fixed all the time. Matthias, can I ask yeah, one minute briefly, only. Please. You asked me to define what the role in TV. I'll give an example. Uh, private media, TRP-led, have an obsession to go to the sensational. It's, it's survival. So when a heinous offense like rape takes place, it's sensationalized. Our standing dictum is we do not show the rape victim, we do not sensationalize it, but we pick up news of retribution against those who rape. And that is our mission. So we aren't that jazzy in the sense we aren't that sensational, but passing home the message through 500 channels that this guy has been sentenced to death or this guy is happening repeatedly is our difference. I just wanted to give you Ma a Matthias Delton, do you ever watch an international broadcast channel? Yes, of course. And what do you watch it for? You know what? Um, I love watching international broadcast channels. I love the German public TV. I think it's one of the highest uh, qualities uh, of uh, public TV or of TV in the world. Um, and for that reason, um, I think with this discussion now, we somehow come to the real point, or we should come to the real point. We have a lot of agreement. We agree that journalism matters, that we need more and better journalism, critical journalism, wonderful. We agree that the digital world is not uh, destroying journalism, uh, that it is a tremendous opportunity, social media an opportunity, wonderful. We do not totally agree that public TV needs higher budgets, but that's a different discussion. But the discussion about budgets of public TV leads us, I think, to the core of the discussion. Because public TV has a business model. And the business model of public TV is the money of the taxpayer. And it is well deserved because you are doing a great job. The digital tech monopolies also have a business model. That is monetizing the data owning and monetizing the data of their consumers. But the remaining rest of players in the media scene have to struggle for a business model. Now, people like Jeff Jarvis are saying, ah, since 15 years, these guys are only complaining instead of being creative and invent new business models. Wonderful. The business model of attention with you have proposed, but you're not absolutely consequently following it because I wanted to read your book and on Amazon I found out I had to pay 20 euros so why don't you give it away for free that would be a wonderful <laughs> role model for the discussion <laughs> however <laughs> however we the attention model didn't work then you could say okay we can monetize private journalism in order not to be obliged to only sensationalize things because that's also an interesting discussion you could say we cross finance it through e-commerce very dangerous. Journalism subsidized by e-commerce, why would you need in the end journalism if you can make, money, make more money with e-commerce only? And how would you really keep the independence of journalism if it is somehow subsidized or monetized by commerce, it's by products? E-commerce? No, we don't do e-commerce. We no. have no e-commerce. We just do what a traditional publishing company does. We create great content. We monetize it through the paying consumer subscription models, we paid through, we monetize it through advertising clients, that is mainly in the internet performance based models, affiliate marketing, and we monetize it through classified ad platforms, real estate, jobs and cars, 
there was for decades one of the most important resources of income for publishers. So, which can, can we bring we, back we, to we international broadcasting? Yeah, but it is not e-commerce. We have no inventory risk. E-commerce is if you, if you sell products where you have inventory risk. However, what I want to say is we need to discuss, if we are talking about the future of journalism, I think we also need to discuss a healthy financial ecosystem for journalism. And how can that look like? Because if that's not existing, then you will reduce the uh, competition and then you will reduce plurality, and I think that is not very good for societies. Jeff Jarvis, you look at international broadcasters? I want to keep it on that subject. Sure, but, but you keep... Matthias brought up all kinds of points. We've not had the opportunity I, to discuss them, so I'm, I'm going to, I'm going to whether you like it or not. And I'd like to hear from them, but, but which, let me just say you know, this. is one of the main points of journalism is that we hear from the public. Let me just, let me just answer your question in two quick ways. One is that I think that public broadcasters, I mean, I'm, I'm American, and, we, and, and I tend to believe in, in, in free market as much as my friend Matthias here. Uh, and so I think that, that it's odd to have a non-market uh, entity in tax-supported broadcasting. But if it is there, I would argue that its role should become an open source, open source uh, source of innovation for all of media, and that, and that companies like Springer should benefit from the risks that it can take that, that uh, as a profit-making company, they can't necessarily take. And I would just say that, that, that uh, Matthias is absolutely right, and the reason I devote myself to business models for news is because we do indeed need sustainable business models for news, but they aren't necessarily yours. They aren't necessarily, there's no God-given right that says that yours must be the one that continues. I hope you do. I work with old media companies. I love old media companies. I want them to. But um, to, to uh, you know, if there's antitrust going on here, uh, colluding with fellow publishers to go for government regulation to f fight down a new competitor in the marketplace doesn't sound like capitalism to me. Uh, I, I think what we have to do... What is capitalism? Capitalism is competition. Yeah. If, if there's a monopoly... As, as uh, a member you, of the You're not anti-capitalistic if you criticize monopoly. And so you, you're joining together with fellow publishers, your supposed okay, competitors, really don't want to, go the after, to, to go after... Too the far down that road, Regulation please. Is not it's a different topic. topic. The it's moderator a wants it's to... It's a different topic, okay. But it's uh, very exciting, I think. It is. It may, it, be, is. it may be very exciting. Okay, I want to oh, hear from the time. audience. If you have questions, please put up or your hands. I, I hope you have. I hope you have questions. Um, yes, there's a gentleman over there. Can we get a microphone to the second row? I don't think those work, actually. I think we have to get a microphone to you. Thank you. Are we on? Yeah. So thank you for the panel discussion. Um, and uh, I, I suppose I should introduce myself. Uh, I'm Matt Armstrong. I'm with the Broadcasting Board of Governors. I'm a member of the, uh, of the board. So what I'd like to do, if I, if I might, is as ask to focus on international broadcasting from the government perspective. So. The, the role of the BBG, which includes Voice of America, Middle East Broadcast Networks, Radio Free Europe, Radio Liberty, Office of Cuba Broadcasting, Radio Free Asia. Our job is to provide news and journalism in areas that don't have it. If it has it, we're not supposed to be there and we pull out. Free news and information. We empower citizen journalists, we bust censorship, we break through, and we uh, create holes in, in firewalls to empower the citizen journalist. We train journalists and we try to create a free and open media locally so that we can get out of the business. So what I would ask is, could we have a discussion on those er areas of the world where that is increasingly important, such as Russia, China, Vietnam, Thailand, parts of Africa, where journalists are, are open season and hunting, and, and you're all doing great jobs, but I'd love to have a conversation on where do we operate in those difficult problem areas, not the challenges of information within the democratic Western civilization, but in the, the other places, please. Sarah Legan, would you like to take that? Actually operating in the United States and in the Western hemisphere is even more important than operating in Africa and, uh, and the oppressed countries, as you say, because that's by default what we do. It's more difficult to, um, to operate and report in the West about unreported and underreported people and sectors of society. It's the flow of information was always from West to East. Now it's becoming the other way around. There are a lot of broadcasters who would like to cover Europe from different perspectives. The kind of stereotype which happened in the past about, for example, the 
jihadist. Let's take an Arabic word that you generalize for terrorist group and that has origins in the Arab, Arabic language, which is totally different. That's reversed. And then how it's stereotyped. There are, there are a lot of issues that could be covered in the West as well as in the third world equally. And that's what we do in Al Jazeera. We have okay. offices around the United States, Europe, and we cover from different perspectives, objectively and accurately as well. Peter Limburg. Yes, I think it's, uh, it's a good thing that uh, we have now new competitors, that we have uh, uh, not only from the West or the United States or from Europe uh, bringing in news to the whole world and they have to listen and they have to accept it. I think it's good that we have uh, the Russians, uh, the Chinese and uh, the, the Gulf states uh, in the market and they should come to us and bring their op opinions. But it's a vice versa thing, thing. So one has to accept also that we go into these regions. And this is the problem. Let me, let me, let me try to, to broadcast Deutsche Welle in Saudi Arabia. This would be a kind of difficult thing. Let me try to go in and broadcast uh, in China. Or let me, let me go in and, and, and broadcast um, in, in, in Russia everywhere with everything. This is, I think, the problem. That uh, it's not the question that we don't want to have here new opinions. The problem is that some parts of the world don't want to hear our opinion anymore because they fear that their kind of government is going to, to, um, to be harmed. I, I think we got it a bit wrong. What he said, no, I'm saying that what he said is that it's a difficult business going into certain difficult countries. What my friend replied is that it's equally difficult penetrating the manufactured discourse of the West. Let's give you an example. I mean, let's, let's, let's get hands on. Let's give an example. Look at the Iraq war. The entire discourse on Iraq, the war, in the first, uh, first one on Iraq or Kuwait was completely unanimous. That's frighteningly unanimous. Vietnam had discordance towards the end. But so we are, what he's saying is that the problem of physical um, vulnerability in certain Asian or Russian or whatever countries, I don't want to name them, somebody else there. What I'm saying, he said that the, there is a vulnerability, there is a danger factor in the physical penetration of these countries, which Peter agreed. But more than this, his submission was, and I tend to agree in part, is that there is an overriding discourse that emanates, and dissidence to that discourse is often more problematic. Okay. It's, it's a viewpoint. It's a viewpoint. Okay. It's both, it can't be put in but, 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 black and okay, white. Okay. But, Okay. It's a real point. The line I want to say is mm. we cover and broadcast news both in East and the West, Third World and First World equally because that's news and it's important to people. Okay, I just want to come back to the question. You, mm. Do you want to come back on this? You raised the question. Um, <coughs> excuse me. Um, the... No, I suppose not. Um, no, I'm sorry. No, just, uh, you don't. The, the, the point is that, yeah, in certain areas it's very difficult. Al Jazeera does a fine job. The Al Jazeera of today is not the same Al Jazeera as it was 10 years ago. Al Jazeera English is a very fine uh, uh, news outlet. And uh, with the uh, comment of Biasim, the Egypt and jailing of Al Jazeera English journalists is wrong. And they need to be freed. There is another environment here, right, with... Uh, with uh, Deutsche Welle and the operations of Deutsche Welle in different parts of the world. I would just like that we converse about these other areas okay. that are challenged. All right, thank you. We're going to move on. Uh, gentlemen over there, and then you. Yeah. My name is Freddy Moko of Reveil FM International. Um, after what I've heard, I have the impression that there's some confusion between um, a media pluralism and a plurality of opinions. So I think we should rather defend a plurality of opinions. Because if you have several media, so maybe some people need to get... Direct link between the uh, imperialism of broadcast and plurality. No, 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 no. Uh, there is a direct link between the quantity of sources of journalism and the pluralism of content. Mm -hmm. Of course, you can say they can all write the same bullshit and they can all be wrong. That's true. But in general, after all the experience, if you have a wide range of different sources, 
the likelihood that you get a plurality is much higher than uh, in an environment where you have three big players and that's it. Okay, gentlemen over there. Can we just take one question voilà. each? Je n'avais pas terminé ma question. I ah. didn't finish my question. <laughs> you haven't finished your question. <laughs> voilà. Okay. Il faut plutôt défendre I la, think we la, must la rather defend the plurality of opinions because in a country médias, where you've got several media sources, where you've where you've got democracy and the liberty of uh, freedom of expression, this is essential. You see that in Africa, that there's countries where there are several media, but there's still censorship, horrible censorship. Um, I'm sorry, we're, we're not set up to take uh, questions in French because I don't think our audience will be getting translations of it. Do you, do you, do you want to just, yes, if you can just briefly summarize in, in the first part, he said that we, he thinks we mix up the pluralism of uh, uh, opinion and the pluralism or quantity of media players in a country and that that is not necessarily the same and I contradicted and I said well but it's related and then he said but there are some examples in countries particularly in African countries where you have uh, a variety of media but they're all under the same censorship and that's why they're all writing the same uh, in the same direction and that's not plurality and here of course I think we all fully agree that if there is censorship and if there is no real freedom of media, then of course a number of players doesn't help. It's all the same state opinion. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, gentleman there, please. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, my name is Joe. I'm a PhD student and, uh, here in Germany. I'm writing on the role of the social media, or the media, as per se, and civil society organization on democratization. Uh, what I would like to see as uh, the future of journalism, as the media, uh, I would like to see a world where the media doesn't just focus on what is happening during the war, like how many soldiers are killed or how many women are killed, but also to look at what other aspects are being created. I'm talking about social inequality, and uh, I'm talking about uh, uh, the, 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 the issue of uh, the animal kingdom, where other news stories are more important there than, than the so others. So you're looking for wider coverage? Yes, wider coverage, as we say. Wider coverage, and not only to look at, okay, they, I know that there's, there's the issue of business, we have to cover and sell the papers or maybe uh, broadcast to the, to the viewers, but also wider coverage in, in the sense that the ideology of, of animal farm concept, where we just cover the things that we want or what our, our funders want, uh, is, is okay. eradicated. Uh, uh, the last one, the last point, sorry. I want to find out, because I know DW is working in different countries, like uh, in my country, Zambia, and also BBC, I think. I want to find out what are the challenges that you are facing because the way uh, Deutsche Welle is regulated here is different from the way the media is regulated in, in other okay. countries. Thank you very much. Peter Limburg, do you want to take that? Well, I, I totally agree that we, uh, we are not supposed only to report on, on wars and on, on economic crisis, but also to bring more stories uh, from um, uh, the regions we're broadcasting in and to, to show also how we reflect on, on the reality in there. So that's what Deutsche Welle tries to do now, is to send out more people into the regions and to get more exclusive stories that you describe not the stories that are always related on, on war zones and, uh, and on, on, on economics, but also uh, of, of common people and their, and their problems, uh, either social problems or uh, every, every problem or solution they have. It's not only reporting about problems, it's also um, showing what solutions other countries and other people can show us here in the West or in, in Germany or in the, the whole world. Um, Concerning the, the, the other question, um, you, you have to... Have to wider coverage, yeah. The wider coverage, mm -hmm. um, well, we, we, uh, you have to be, excuse me, more precise on the question, what exactly is the question? Could you, could you tell us again what, what the question Well, he was is? saying that he wanted more, but not just about how many people died and under what circumstances they died, but more about business and... and uh, 
I, I easily <laughs> agree. Matthias Döfner said I easily agree, as far as I, I think uh, I said already. Yeah. Okay, all right. Gentleman over there. We'll, we'll have to get another microphone to you. Yeah. Khalid Hamid Farooqi from Geo Television News and Jung Newspaper uh, in Pakistan. Uh, what we see, I am a correspondent based in Brussels, and I am among a very large number of uh, journalists always in, based in Brussels. What we see, particularly European journalists are concentrated, they seems to me, when it comes to war and their troops engaged in war, they are very conformist. And uh, Mr. Tim Sebastian, you are coming from UK. Don't you worry about, uh, are you not worried about that one person, Rupert Murdoch, owning so many newspapers and bringing same story and a uh, lot of time manufacturing consent type of story when British troops are engaged in Afghanistan or in Iraq or Mosul. Thank you. Well, I don't think people are particularly interested in what my views are, but I mean, I'll answer, I'll answer it just, just, just for the sake of it. Um, I think there should be as wide a variety of voices as possible, wide a variety of ownership of the media as possible. Uh, Matthias Döpfner? Totally true. And um, th that, that's what, what I said. I mean, there is a link between the number of media owners and the plural pluralism. And if there are only very few, then this phenomenon that you have just described may occur. And particularly if a country is militarily involved. I mean, that's, that's what I think distinguishes good journalism from a kind of intentional journalism. And good journalism should never be intentional, even if, even if it's for a good cause. Journalists should uh, stay out of all camps and uh, ask the critical questions. Can we hear from one? Uh, he was referring to patriotic journalism. Pardon? He was referring to patriotic journalism. The sudden burst of patriotism that comes, even when there are discordant voices, to stand behind a nation in war. That's that's a very visible tendency. You see, we grew up in the in the in the years of dissidence, 69, 70, 74. So we have seen students, we have seen journalists, we have seen the academics taking on state power, take and living to tell the tale. So what he is referring to perhaps is a domineering discourse that tends to stand behind Western nations mainly when they are engaged in combat without giving adequate space to the other voice. That's all. I mean, it's, it's just an academic point of view. All right. I, we're we're going to hear from the Twitter feed. And then Chipanda Chimbalu, yes. you have something from Twitter? Yes. Uh, we do have a lot of questions coming with our hashtag DW underscore GMF. Um, so we have one comment here from Tillman who says, uh, and a question included, some countries refuse international broadcasters' programs mainly out of fear, yes but isn't wanting to be there, just a new colonialism. So this is a question definitely for the uh, international broadcasters uh, on this panel. And then there's another question directed directly to Jeff Jarvis, and uh, it, this is a user, his name is, um, well, JR at Ujora is his, ha is his uh, handle. And he says, if social media is the new journalism, are Google, etc., the new gatekeepers? Jeff Jarvis. Briefly, uh, no, they're the platforms that enable anyone and everyone to speak. Take the example of what's happening here. You're the gatekeeper who decides who to speak. And by the way, we've only heard from men so far. Let's add that up here and there. Uh, that's a gatekeeper function. Whereas you're a platform, then anyone can use it to say anything they want on it unless they are stopped by a, by a government. And that a platform is a different, is a different would, than would a gatekeeper. Would you then agree, just very briefly, would you then agree that there should be a transparent and fair criteria for search results, or can they subjectively do it, downgrade, upgrade? This is where we get to the question of relevance. If they would reveal their, their algorithm, which is what you're asking, then they would be gained. They would be gained by everyone out there, who, which no, is no, what no, we no, find. No, no, that's, that's, that's not my true. question. I'm talking that's about true. fair search. The, the search results, do they need then, because you're saying they are just a neutral platform, but in fact what they do today is they upgrade certain listings and they downgrade certain listings independent from the traffic figures. Um, Would you agree that that should be according to traffic only in order to be neutral because that's the question? No, it's according to relevance and what's happening. Can I ask the question now? Yeah, but if the they now. decide what is relevant, then they are uh, more than a... They're deciding uh, based on the data because what's going to happen now is we're not all going to have the same search results because we have more relevance. It's not like mass media. It's actually relevant to you or me. So that's going to be dependent upon many factors, including the authority of, of, of the site, 
uh, uh, my own behavior, my past desires, where I am right now in my context, those are all things that go into search. So no, I don't want the exact same search results that you have. So you're saying, again, just to repeat it, you say a monopolist that owns 90% or 99% of the search can decide how he deals with the search results independent from their traffic. What are you figures? proposing that should happen instead? Of the course. government should come in and tell them what no, to do? Well, no. you're the one who's running the government. No, Jeff, don't, please. Be, you are. Remain you're, running, fair. you're running, you're running the government, asking them. No. Okay. I'm, no, no. I'm, Jeff, I'm, Jeff, I'm, Jeff, I'm, no, please I'm gonna, answer I'm going to break into this in, in, yeah, in a moment because... I think he, does, he may not get away with not answering the question. Okay, but, but I there, think you've got to have your own show. You two, you've got to have your own show because right. you've, got, you've, got a lot, you've got a lot to discuss here. <laughs> and it's eight years away from the core subject. Peter Limbo, colonialism. Colonialism, I have to answer to Tillman, I think, and I have to say no Tillman, it's not colonialism because we reach about 0.5 to 2% of the audience and this is about every uh, international news broadcaster does in the country. So I don't think that with this amount of figures we, we could really be addressed as colonialists. So Tillman, forget this. Salonegan, no, no colonialism out of Qatar, too small. Yes. Uh, <laughs> didn't have history of, but I think the, the colonialism issue is long past. Uh, it's, it's not an issue for discussion now. I can think of BBC, for example, broadcasting to Africa and Asia as, uh, as part of colonialism. Uh, and Qatar so, doesn't look on Al Jazeera as soft power? Uh, well, for international media organization, if you create a brand name for yourself, you become a brand name for the country. When you say BBC or CNN, you remember UK and US. Now, when you say Al Jazeera, you remember Qatar. And you remember it for the values that Al Jazeera represent, which is transparency, objectivity, and quality of, uh, of coverage, which is a very important factor uh, for Qatar. Okay, we have time for one brief question. Lady, lady there, yes. Can we, can we just get a microphone to you, please? I'd like you to clarify on your last point. You said in your talk that you, Al Jazeera has some kind of mission. And for the Egyptians in the audience and the Bahrainis in the audience, we are very aware of Al Jazeera's mission when it becomes a combatant in the conflict. And, uh, and you know, I'm, this is no way to justify the treatment of Al Jazeera staff in Cairo in any way, but Bahrain is across the pond, less than 100 kilometers from Qatar. And the me it's been, you know, you've again, uh, re-engendered the sectarian dis hegemonic discourse that you say Al Jazeera is there to fight against. So if you can comment on that, I'd be very grateful. No, I wouldn't take Briefly, that. Salah, no, no, because we haven't got a long time. I, I wouldn't take that as a fact. What I would say is Al Jazeera is covering news from all sides, take all points of views, and it doesn't just broadcast the government side of the story or the opposition side of the story. If you don't like the other side of the story, that's your problem. And you'll have to live with it because you have to know the story as complete, not from one specific angle. That's what we have done in Bahrain. That's what we have done in Egypt. That we, that's what we are doing in Syria and everywhere else. You'll find sometimes the empty chair policy because governments are trying to silence us by boycotting us. So we play the devil's advocate. If the opposition is the president, then we are going to play the devil's advocate and ask the questions or put the point of view that okay. the government was supposed to do. You have, That's you have, what we you have 30 seconds to respond to that, if you would like to. That may be your position in Egypt. When it came to Bahrain, it's not even in the news in the first place. I've been in a situation where there have been protesters killed, there have been prisoners. It hasn't, you have not even reported on on the news that's so close to home. And I can give you examples from the last week I'll, I'll just, where uh, the BBC okay. would report. I'll, and even in Saudi Arabia, I have to say, uh, there is a policy to boycott Al Jazeera in Bahrain okay. by the government. I'll, 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 say, I'll, say, I'll say one sentence. Al Jazeera has produced a program called Shouting in the Dark about the protests in Bahrain that got, got 10 awards, really, and has, uh, is viral online. All right. How do you say we are covering it? Okay. Unfortunately, we're out of time. Thank you very much to our panelists. Thank you to you, the audience, as well. Have a very good afternoon. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you.